board and help us out. And uh, so uh, Graham Watt here is going to introduce our speaker for us. Thanks for coming. Thanks for always. Great. Uh, Graham Watt, proud Egg Society member. And a couple of months ago, I was talking with Rolly and Sheila, and we were dreaming about we've got to have another great speaker. And, uh, another AGMS here, help get people out to it. We're so all having a time for Steiner come before and, and, and talk about seats. And so I was thinking, well, I'm doing some water stuff. Um, maybe uh, if you could have someone talk about water and it you could be fine. And so, luckily, not long before I, I met uh, Gord Hebert um, of um, uh, uh, Element Eco Design in Vernon. I met him at a conference in the Okanagan. And, that is we need to bring them. So I guess that, you know, logistics is very good and figuring out how to get them back and everything else. It's my real pleasure to um, introduce you here tonight who uh, lives in Vernon, has elementary good design. He's originally from uh, Burns Lake, but thankfully has, has found the Southern Interior Dry Belt and has been uh, learning and teaching permaculture for quite a few years now. And I'll tell you a bit more about permaculture as part of the talk tonight, but I think it's a, a really a fascinating design system for agriculture, societies, farms, houses, whatever, um, that I think can help us think about our, our agricultural systems in a new way. So we'll learn tonight about water and soil and such good things. Please welcome me. So I'm Gord Hebert, and about um, five years ago, I had a dream of starting a permaculture company. I was working in Calgary. And I did a brief stint in Calgary. And there were houses there. I went to school, got a business degree, and realized that that was not the right way to go. I should have chosen a different path. So I went back to what I knew, which was building. And I started working for an energy efficient home builder and we started doing some really neat projects. So, some solar design, some solar construction, looking at how houses were built and how that can lead to sustainability. And I thought it was a really good piece of the puzzle, but it wasn't a pure solution. So within about two years of working there, I met a mechanical engineer named Rob Davis. And he designed these mechanical systems that were so simple. And all the other engineers were adding all these electrical components, fancy fans, and control devices. Rob would just bare bones design it, and it would work almost twice as effective. So inspired by that, I said, Rob, how do you do this? And he said, oh, it's just permaculture. And so the next couple months, I pretty much wanted it constantly. Um, every lunchtime, every after work, and I just kept saying, what's permaculture? What's permaculture? And he said, OK, well, here's what I'm doing. I'm trying to design myself out of a career of mechanical engineering into the role of being a permaculture designer. He said, so why don't you come out and take a course? So I took the intro course with him. And at the end of the course, he said, oh, you're terminal. <laughs> and it was great. After that, I was up. Um, I found it something that it was a good design system for sustainable living, and it had a lot of the answers that I've been looking for for a while. And now I've just been inspired by that. And for the last three years, I've had Element Eco Design with my wife Jana, and we do edible landscaping, and we teach people about food security and permaculture design. It's a terrible business model because we teach people to do the systems themselves. Now, but it's really, it's really great. It's really liberating, and it's really empowering to see people grasp these concepts and become more interdependent. As part of this, and part of the reason I moved to the Okanagan was um, I studied in Australia and learned a lot about water harvesting and how we can use water to create abundant landscapes. And compared to the world, we live in a water abundant landscape. So we just need to learn how to use that water a little more efficiently. So I've created a little bit of a PowerPoint that goes over which methods are most specific to our landscape, which is somewhere between temperate and arid uh, that we fall into. So who's heard of permaculture before? How many people have taken permaculture courses? OK, so we've got the long-winded definition. Um, so permaculture is a design science framework for designing regenerative human settlements and landscapes based on observation of natural principles to take care of all human needs. <coughs> Keyword here is regenerative. So we're going from past the point of sustainability, which is just sort of maintaining things, as the word's currently understood, to actually making landscapes better as we use them. 
and to continue that legacy into the future. And to take care of all human needs, so that's food, shelter, water, and economic stability. So we need to be able to provide for ourselves, for ourselves, and make our land work for us. Um, commonly, permaculture is known as just gardening. I've heard that a lot. But Graham Burnett said it best that permaculture is a revolution disguised as organic gardening because it is so much more than just about food. It's actually a contraction of two parts. So um, permaculture is permanent agriculture and permanent culture. So with perma permanent agriculture, we're looking at regenerative agriculture. So long-term sustainable food systems. We're looking at things like soil, the water cycle, and we're looking at the entire ecology around our farms. And we're trying to fix that and maintain that in a healthy balance. We're trying to mimic the natural ecosystem. So we're looking at the nature as our inspiration, taking cues from that, and then applying it to our practices. And we can make these systems highly productive. Now, permanent culture, and this is probably the best part of permaculture, is that it really works on strengthening interpersonal relationships. And you can do this through food. And I've been doing um, many social experiments in my backyard. So who's ever grown a zucchini? <laughs> who's ever had more than enough zucchini? <laughs> so it's just to show that when you have a surplus, you have the option of sharing it. And um, when we first moved into our house, we had a yellow plum tree. And coming from Burns Lake, I had had no experience with fruit trees. So I was waiting for this plum to turn purple. And waited and waited and waited. And one night before I was about to take a trip up north, I went out and actually my wife went out and she grabbed the plum, bit into it, and she said, oh wow, these are ready. And we are in trouble. So we did a rush harvest, it was 75 pounds. And so what did we do the night before a road trip on 75 pounds of plums? Well, we went and had care packages for all of our neighbors. And we had just moved in. We looked like a pretty rough group. The first thing I did was rent our basement, so I know that they were probably thinking what I was doing downstairs. <laughs> and um, all of a sudden, all of our neighbors started coming to us, asking us what we were doing, asking us where we're from, asking about us. And all of a sudden, it felt like we were part of that community. And so to have that sense of belonging is really one of the greatest things, and it gives us a real sense of security. And so we've been building on that uh, permanent culture aspect. And it's also empowering individuals. So teaching old world skills to people again, so we don't lose lost arts like canning, knitting, and um, agriculture. And also building resilient communities. So we're part of the Transition Network, which uh, Transition Town Network was started in um, uh, Kinsale, Ireland. And what it is is communities getting together, banding together, and um, doing their part to make the community that they see. So they have visioning sessions and they get together and they really start making the community in their eyes and they work with local governments. It's just a really good example of a permaculture experiment gone right. Um, yeah, that's all it was for the permaculture designer that this was their final design project was to see how permaculture design system applied to a city. And this, that was the result. Now the transition network is worldwide and doing some wonderful work. So um, there's two authors of permaculture. One is Bill Mollison, the other is David Holmgren. And they've each written books on permaculture. David Holmgren wins points for making it easiest to understand. It's 12 simple steps in permaculture. It's a permaculture 12-step program. It's 12 principles that are easy to follow for designing. And um, they're based around three core ethics. So it's just care of earth, care of people, and fair share. So realizing that our Earth is just a sphere floating in space, it's not getting any bigger or smaller, so we have a finite amount of resources, so we need to use them wisely. Um, care of people, having healthy respect for each other, and um, being able to listen to each other, and also creating that interpersonal relationship and community. And fair share, that's the zucchini concept. So if you have more than you need, um, share your surplus. It's not always in material goods, it's not always in money, it can be in knowledge. When I was first learning how to garden, uh, I had a bunch of people, specifically my mother-in-law, teaching me years of her knowledge, and it took my learning curve like this. I avoided a lot of first-time mistakes because of it. So fair share can be all of those things. Um, quickly, I'll just go over the 12 permaculture principles. And I've made a little explosion mark by uh, the ones we're gonna be paying attention to tonight. So number one is observe and interact. It's just looking at the landscape, seeing what it can tell you. So where are there hot spots, cool spots? 
what's growing where and why? The most important question you can always ask is why. Um, capture and store energy. So using the sun uh, to grow plants, that's a great energy storage device. Also, holding back water in the landscapes we'll be focusing on. Obtaining a yield, well that's the best part. We get something from our hard work. We have self-regulate and accept feedback. Quick example of this, an embarrassing story. It's always goes over well. Um, I had a compost pile when I moved to my place. It was at the bottom of my property, down a hill, across a little creek, off in the corner of the property. I thought, what a good spot. No one can see the compost, no one will ever complain about it, and it will be perfect, easy to tend to. Then, that north slope got about a foot of snow, and I started going down there, and it turned into a skating rink. And after three slides down the hill, I realized that compost is not in a good spot. And so that was my feedback loop telling me it needs to be closer to the house, somewhere easier to be. So we need to look at things and constantly be analyzing our systems around our house. Or your farm, your garden, however you're using this. Um, use and value renewables. So a common example I use is we live in BC, we have a lot of wood around us. It's a renewable energy source, so we should be building our houses out of wood if it's a local product. Um, producing no waste. So making closed loop systems, and a good example of that is just composting. You grow vegetables, you take the food scraps and also your plant scraps, you compost them down into more compost and soil, and you use that to grow more vegetables. And that's what we're aiming to do with permaculture, to always have these closed loop systems. Keep as much as you can on your property so you don't have to go out and buy other things. Um, design from pattern to detail. We're going to go a little more in depth onto this. Um, it's recognizing patterns in the landscape. I remember Jeff Lawton taught me, um, everybody has a pattern eye. And you just have to be told you have a pattern eye and all of a sudden you'll start activating. And I thought, okay, I don't know about that. And next time I went out and I looked at a landscape, all of a sudden things were popping out of it. Wet spots, dry spots, uh, little areas of microclimate. When I'd walk by something, um, I would feel more heat from that area. And it's just because I started paying attention. So your pattern eyes that one. Um, integrate. So make things work together. So rather than having a solar panel, a roof, and a rain barrel, use those together. So your solar panel can be a water, uh, it can be mounted on your roof. They can be used to capture rainwater, and the rain barrel can hold that water. And then the solar panel can power a pump to move that water around the landscape. So it's working, things working together. Small, slow solutions. This is key. Um, we've had students that have taken a design course and they're really pumped. They want to go home and it's like the permaculture wet dog syndrome. And they just want to permaculture all over everybody. And what happens when you do that? People sort of take a step back, they go, oh, no. And um, they try to apply everything all at once as well. So if you choose small projects to start, if people have never gardened, you tell them, start a herb garden. And then start a small vegetable garden. But get those systems under control and then move on to the next thing. And so it's a lot, makes your life a lot easier and things are easier to maintain. Use and value diversity. Um, by creating more diverse landscapes, we can, there's tons of benefits. Um, especially with, when we start looking at agroforestry, food forestry. Um, by having a balanced ecosystem, you really minimize your pest and disease outbreaks because the system starts to regulate itself. It's never about um, taking something away from a permaculture system, it's about adding to. So a common example is um, somebody comes up to me and says, I've got a corn farm and I've got it infested with grasshoppers, it's a real problem. And I might say, well, no, you don't have a grasshopper problem, you have a turkey deficiency. So, it's looking at things on a new angle, and it's not about taking things away, it's about adding things to the system. Um, use the edge and value the marginal. So it's about creating microclimates, and looking for microclimates and using those to your advantage. And then finally, creatively use and respond to change. So the goals of permaculture are to character existing ecosystems and regenerate degraded ecosystems and create personal complex living environments. And we're going to focus today on uh, regenerating degraded ecosystems. So design is patterning, and this is part of permaculture that I find that borders the most on esoteric, or as I like to say, 
Um, it walks a very fine line because once you start realizing that these patterns are all around us in nature, um, it can really um, inspire design and gets you really involved in the landscape and makes you feel like you're part of nature again. So permaculture is composed of strategies and techniques. The strategy is the overall goal of what we're trying to do. And so it's the land planning, the bird's eye view of the plan. And then the techniques are how we're going to go about doing those things. So if I say I want to start a garden, I'll have a strategy for going about doing it. And my techniques could be no-till, it could be organic gardening, it could be lasagna gardening or sheet mulching. And those are all the techniques of how and when I would do them. And this idea of patterning comes from careful and thoughtful observation. So it's only that by paying attention to the landscape and paying attention to the system you're involved in that you can really start to learn from it. Um, I was into building for a long time. I wanted to be an architect someday, I still might be. But Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, my favorite architect, says, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature, it will never fail you. And the same goes with native plants. They can really be inspiring for us because what we see around us is all research and development. The plants that are established here, they are suited for a niche in this climate. And so we can learn something from them if we know what their needs are. Um, quick little plug, there's a book called Weeds and Why They Grow. It's a USDA study of North American weeds and how they, what they tell us. So weeds are indicators of soil condition, and so they can tell us whether it's silky, sandy, clay soil, or what minerals it's lacking in. It's a really interesting book, available from Baker's Magazine, and super helpful. <coughs> Um, exactly. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. How water is moving through our ecosystems and the patterns that we can uh, apply from nature. So has anyone ever heard of the dendritic pattern? This is basically it here. You've got a central trunk and then it branches and each branch has another branch coming off of it. Now what does this pattern look like? Brain cells. Brain cells, absolutely. What about central nervous system? A tree? And also a watershed. So if we look at where up in the highlands, we've got sheet flow going into rills, into a runnel, into a valley, into a creek, into a river, and then back into the ocean through a delta. So it's how things flow. And this is one pattern that we're really going to pay attention to today because it is part of key line design. Um, factors affecting our water. So we all hear about climate change. I'm not subscribing to global warming or anything like that, but there is changing climate issues happening. Um, we're seeing warmer temperatures, but we're also seeing, seeing cooling temperatures. We see more extreme weather events. Temperature isn't moderated or weather isn't moderated anymore. It's more going like this. We're seeing higher peaks. Um, we've got increased floods, but also increased droughts. We've got topsoil and erosion, and which is causing increased irrigation. So in some ways, it's kind of a cycle because increased irrigation can make topsoil go away, and it can cap soil, and which causes more drought. But these are just some of the factors affecting our water. Also, um, and these are the only doom and gloom sides. After this, we're going to focus on solutions. Um, agriculture. So we've got increased crop demand. Um, Western cultures are influencing Eastern cultures a lot, especially in diet. So people are starting to eat a lot more beef and that's affecting our water because it takes a lot of water to grow the crops that, to have beef and to also water those beef. Um, so that's increased meat demand, which causes increased irrigation. Um, chemical inputs are leaching into our water tables and centralized production. So having all, everything in one place, um, I think it was David Suzuki that said, the solution is dissolution. So spreading things out, spreading the pollution out and um, not having it centralized can really help the earth manage itself. Increased industry. So if more industry equals more water use. Um, unsafe practices leading to pollution and disposal. And then domestically, uh, people, it's funny in the Okanagan, we've got the highest water use per capita in Canada. 
in the driest watershed in Canada. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing to see, um, but you know, people have to wash their parking stalls. <laughs> um, sanitation and disposal, so how we're dealing with our wastewater, and then stormwater runoff, so how we're dealing with our stormwater. But there are tools to solve these problems, and that's how I look at permaculture. It's a design system, and it's like a tool belt. So in my tool belt, I've got water harvesting, I've got agroforestry, I've got key line design, and I've got um, all sorts of other different tools. And they're all applied in certain instances. So the bigger your tool belt, the more versatile you are. And we're going to be focusing really on broadland or broad acre design today. And we're going to be focusing on key line, which is the strategy for land management and specifically water management. And then we're going to look at holistic management, which is a um, it's another strategy, but we're going to be focusing on the technique side of it for building healthy soil. We'll start with key line. So key line design actually predates permaculture. Um, P.A. Yaumans in Australia was a brilliant man. He was a mining engineer and him and his brother-in-law were out uh, in a field one day and wildfire crept up on him and P.A. survived and his brother-in-law did not. And rather than blaming the fire for his brother-in-law's death, he looked past it and he said it was the fact that the landscape was in a drought condition that caused that bushfire. And so he wanted to look at the landscape and figure out what caused that drought condition and see if he could remedy it. That's pretty huge thinking. So in 1953, he came up with the key line plan. And this was a way of looking at the landscape, identifying how water moves through the landscape, where the dry spots are, and basing a system around it that could provide easy, efficient, cheap irrigation in Australia, in dry lands. And so he's written a whole bunch of different books. Um, If you go to the soilhealthlibrary.org, you can get most of these as free download. And they're fantastic reads. And so he's got everything from broad acre right down to uh, city landscapes. And from this, he invented the key line plow, which is a great implement for building topsoil at a pretty rapid rate. So he had this scale of permanence, and so it was sort of a checklist of how he would rate things and how he would design. Number one, you have to know your climate. Number two, the land shape, so the geography. Number three, how water works and plan your water system out. Number four, put in your roads. Five, revegetate with trees. Six, add your buildings and your subdivisions. And seven or eight is soil. I thought, when I first learned this, I thought, it's really funny, I would be addressing soil as one of my priorities. But what he does is he designs the entire system, and then as his first strategy, or as his overall strategy, but as as his first practical technique, he addresses soil, topsoil quality, and how to grow topsoil. So that's really where you shift from your planning into your technique. So key line design, I'm going to give a a, a little example and then we'll go into it a little more in depth. So this is P.A. Yaumann's property called Yobarni. And he's done the design, he's put in all the earth dams according to what the landscape could provide. And after doing his climate data, he put in his drains. So he either has this dam running down into the next dam, And he's also got irrigation channels running from here to have sheet flow irrigation to irrigate this land down below. Any irrigation that's lost is picked up here in the next dam. This dam flows into here, and you can see there's just an interconnected landscape. At every elevation, he's capturing water as high up in the landscape as he can, and he's using it as many times as he can before it leaves that landscape. And after the water's taken care of, he's supposed to go to his roads. So what he did was he actually used those irrigation canals because they're on a slight drop and he used those as his roadways. So he's stacking the function. He's putting the roadway and then the ditch is actually harvesting water for his dams. And then he's using the dam walls as his roadway. And then that kind of dictates where you can start putting subdivisions or where you can start placing home lots. This was on 760 acres so this is actually a huge piece of land. And then after the subdivisions all laid out, 
reforest those areas. You're already harvesting water off the roads, so why not put some trees there? And they can help shade the road, increase the water harvesting, and decrease the evaporation, and just make the landscape productive again. So, if we look at Grand Forks, um, I got this from kettleriver.ca. So they've got a water management, watershed management plan, and your annual average precipitation is just a little bit better than Vernon. So you're about 17 inches. Is that pretty accurate, Graham? Interesting. I guess you got it from the study. Okay. <laughs> and um, what happens though is in May and September, you guys get an awful lot of evaporation and you go into water deficit. So those are the periods that you need most of your water. And most of the watershed in the Kettle River or Kettle Valley is from runoff, about 78% of it. So think about not harvesting water, but harvesting snow. So how can you best use that snow before it leaves the landscape? And next, look at the land shape. So there's, in the key line design, there's a point called the key point. And that is where the landscape goes from steep and convex to concave. So it's where it levels out. So if we're looking at a slope like this, it's right when it starts to flatten out. So we can identify it as right there. And identifying this point in the landscape is key. Well, it's a key point. But um, it's the point that's highest up in the landscape that can harvest the most water. And I'll demonstrate that in a sec. But it's important to know the different areas as well. And I always use my fist as a way to remember my landscape and topography. So each knuckle is a ridge. The largest knuckle would be a main ridge, and then you've got a primary ridge, primary valley. And so water is going to move off of those slopes, and you're going to be working on the lower slopes, and you're always working above the floodplains and riparian zones. Where we're working usually with key line design <coughs> is between the sheet flow and the valley. We're never working in damming creeks or rivers because we're staying out of fish bearing areas and we're staying into areas that are usually seasonally creeks, seasonal creeks um, working to restore watersheds. So understanding your site. If you're ever having trouble reading a contour map, you always have one right here. So if you were to, is everyone familiar with contour maps? Who's not familiar with contour maps? So they, each contour represents a level piece of land. And if you draw contours on your hand, so there would be a couple circles around here, and then you flatten it out, you can take a 2D contour map and make it 3D. It's helpful for me in uh, reading maps sometimes with dyslexia. So if we understand our site, and here's your Barney again, P.A. Yaman looked at all of these different contours and so when contours point down like this, this is a valley. So in the valley, the landscape comes tightly together and it's quite steep, but it's also the optimal point for harvesting water. So imagine, if you will, we're going to build a dam. If we were to build it out here on a ridge, we would have to take all of this material just to make a dam like this. So it requires a lot more material. If you're making a dam in here, you're just going between two points and then you're storing water up the valley. So it really makes it much easier to store. So, is that clear? Okay. So what we're doing is we're using these contours. The water's running down these rivers here and we're building across the valleys. Because valleys are wet usually, right? Water will concentrate in valleys and then we always see drier ridges. Um, we can even see it on our body. I have two ridges and a valley and this is where chest hair comes. It's where the area is vegetated. It's a terrible example but you'll never forget it. <laughs> so water always moves from top of the slope into the valley. And we want to capture it in the valley because that's where the greatest concentration <coughs> of water is. If you look around the landscape, there's always points in the landscape that are the last to go yellow. So there's always a spot of green. You'll notice that those are always at the base of a slope. 
or in the valley. You'll notice where um, deciduous vegetation is growing. You can start to look at these points in the landscape and realize that those hold water. And so those are the areas you want to look at first for water harvesting. And what we're doing is we're slowing the water down. We're using it in its passive state because when water is running fast, it's erosive. But when we slow water down and it sits perfectly level, then we can take all of that erosive energy away and capture it for use at a later time. So just some key principles of how water behaves. It flows perpendicular to contour. So if we're looking at this map, the water is going to be flowing like this. And then as we move into the valley, we can see that it's concentrating there and it's dispersing on the ridge. So there's not as much water here as there is in the valley. And it speeds up on slope. So that's why we're not harvesting water right here. So when contour lines are closer together, then you've got a steeper slope. When they're further apart, it's flatter. And we don't want to be harvesting water right here because the water's moving too quickly. We want to get it right when it starts to slow down. So that's right at that key point. So if we can identify that point in the landscape, we can start harvesting water. So the water cycle. What we're trying to do is get the water to stay in the landscape. Think of the soil as a sponge. And if you can keep that sponge hydrated, soil can store up to three times its weight in water. So the best place to put that water is in the soil and create healthy soil, create an environment for healthy soil. If we've got compacted soil, we're just getting runoff. And we're getting nutrients stripped down and they're leaving the property or leaving the landscape. So if we can create an environment where things will infiltrate rather than pacify, then we can create a more productive landscape. And I am going to come back to this and explain this better for the dams. So this is where our soil surface management is absolutely key. So if we look at a slope like this, and it's completely not vegetated, we've got water running down into a creek at the bottom. And so it's just like in a human and in, in urban environment. We've got storm sewers just funneling water right into one river, lake, or stream, and it's just blasting out a ton of water, which is going to cause erosion and incising, and this creek bed's going to drop, and it's going to cause a bunch, of, a bunch of problems with the native vegetation. You're also going to get deposits of all your topsoil going straight into that creek. So we want to keep the topsoil on site. So what can we do? We can revegetate. But we can also make this useful for farming and specifically cattle. This is a little bit from holistic management. So at the top of the slopes where it's too steep to harvest water or to operate machinery, forest it. There's a great book called um, Tree Crops of a Permanent Agriculture by J. Russell Smith, written in the 1920s. He had sustainable forest management figured out. Basically, the premise is on any slope greater than 30 degrees, you plant trees. And it stabilizes the slope, it reduces erosion, and re re eliminates topsoil loss, or reduces topsoil loss. And what they did here was add a fence for cattle, so the cattle can't go in here and cause a bunch of scuffing on the hillside, or else the cattle can use this area as cover, and as, or if you have pigs, range them in the trees. And what that does is create a nutrient drop down to this area. You could also put in a silvopasture. So a silvopasture silver is just a row or a belt of trees throughout a field. And if you've done it on key line or on contour, it actually works as a water harvesting implement. It can also shade and provide cover for um, ranging cattle. It allows you to still have a workable field. So if you are still using this field for hay, then you can still get a tractor in there and you can still work between the silvopasture. But it's kind of like hedging your bets. So if you, it's like a long-term investment. So let's take a black walnut. You plant a silvopasture of black walnut. It might be 50 years before you harvest that, but when you do, it's going to be a long-term investment. It's going to pay its dividends because black walnut is a high-value timber crop. And it can also give you a nut harvest in the meantime. So it's about diversifying the farm and it's about getting more than one income. And then at the bottom, we're protecting our riparian areas. So 
By planting around your riparian area, you're actually going to increase the amount of water that is, it's able to hold back and the amount of um, water that's available for the landscape. And also keeping uh, fencing out livestock from immediate riparian areas, that's going to keep any pollution or any contaminants from livestock from getting into the waterways. So this is just good practices. And what we're trying to do is repair the water cycle. Um, before we start harvesting, we want to see how much we can repair. So I got to take part in a um, dry land water harvesting course last year on um, erosion control. And the Covera Coalition is doing great work down in New Mexico and Craig Sponholtz from Dryland Solutions came up and he taught a course on how to repair damaged creeks and with really, really simple systems. So it's starting at the top down. You're using simple technology, rocks, and you're controlling the water. So at the top of the creek, or at the top of a flow, when you're at this sheet flow, so you get water coming in, it tries to centralize that water with a media luna, so a half moon. It's just one rock thick, and you make it into a half moon, and what it does is it points all that water into one direct stream to go down the steep part of the hill. Now down that steep part of the hill, you do a rock spillway, or they call it a rock mulch rundown. So then the water's moving over the rocks, and it's not taking the topsoil away and causing erosion. It's just tumbling down, but some of it's also soaking into the landscape, and it has a chance to revegetate. When you get to the bottom, and this water has gained a whole bunch of energy. It's going faster, and it comes to the bottom, and they drop it into what's called a Zuni bowl. All of these techniques are based on um, the North American natives, the Zunis and the Hopi Indians, and simple solutions. They were master water harvesters. So it drops into this Zuni bowl. So it's just a rock basin that's rock lined all the way, and it drops the water in, and then it settles it out. And it takes away all of the erosive uh, power of that water. And then it provides an overflow for the water to sheet flow out of there. And when it has sheet flow, it's spread out and it dissipates that energy so it's not eroding the landscape. And then you can add these one rock dams to actually angle the stream and create an, create an induced meandering effect. Because as you in, um, encourage a stream to meander, it's covering a greater, greater surface area. It's hydrating more of a stream. It's spreading that water flow out, and it's adding more water to the landscape. And then finally, when you reach the base of the hill and you reach a flat plain, you put an, another media luna in. And what that media luna does, rather than concentrate, you do, instead of the frowning face, you do a smiley face, and it spreads the water out into sheet flow onto the landscape. And so very, very passive, very easy water harvesting. So, Gordon, just to, to, I think of the, the, this wouldn't be sort of for a fish bearing stream, this would be more one that's uh, ephemeral stream that's like gullying the heck out of the hill and blowing out the bottom and causing a but it's not sort of for a larger stream. No, this is definitely, yeah, we're definitely working up in this part of the, the, water the watershed, yeah, always working above uh, fish bearing streams. Um, I encourage you to go on to Dryland Solutions. They've got great downloads, great PDFs, um, a lot of information, and really good stuff for our climate. <coughs> so ponds and dams. Now we'll get back to this and how to construct a dam. So if we locate the key point, in this instance, it's when the uh, steep goes to flat, so it would be right here. And that would be the point that's highest up in the landscape that we could possibly start harvesting water. And so we say, okay, we'd like to take the dam and put it across here. So what we'd be doing is taking an excavator and basically taking the material from here and building a dam here, and building this up. Now there are some conditions that have to be necessary. This has to be on less than an 8% slope. You need 40% clay uh, to make this really effective and to really hold the water in, and it has to be done right, especially if you look at a dam like this. Um, this would be a ridge point dam, so this would be a dam built way out here. 
It requires the most material, it's the hardest to build, and it's the le most likely to fail if it one ever will. Um, it just requires a whole lot of material. The easiest place to build a dam is definitely in a valley. You can also build a dam on top. It's called a saddle dam. So you would harvest the material like that and then create a water pool up there. And there's a ton of different dams, but the general construction of this, and this is a really quick uh, overview of dam construction, but this is a good primer. So what you're looking for is a three to one slope. And this is a key way. This is key to dam construction. You have to have your best quality soil or um, clay in there. And it's basically like a lock pin to hold that dam in place as the water, as the water pressure comes from upslope and starts pushing this way on the key way, that will hold it in place. It's like a foundation or a footing. And then you, every layer you put on, you compact the heck out of it and just make sure it's super solid and compacted. You plan an overflow where the excess water can overflow out of the dam. You usually plan it your, um, your freeboard. You have uh, about half a meter of freeboard. That's your maximum water level. You always want to leave room for extra water. And then you have a spillway that comes out of that. So what that would look like is <coughs> now you've got a dam here <coughs> and you'd want to create a little spillway here that would be about half a meter lower that would flow into an irrigation channel. And you have the option of doing this on contour, which is perfectly level on the landscape, or you can do it on key line, which is slightly off contour. So there's a, there was a, a good article a couple of years ago um, on Permaculture Research Institute Australia website. It was swales or contour versus key line. So swales are on contour and what they do is they go perfectly across the landscape on the level line. So in theory, we could take any overflow from that pond and if we followed a contour line, we could take it all the way back into the pond. Now what key line says is we know these uh, valleys are super wet. They're much more wet and the ridges are dry and they need more moisture. So what Key Line says is we're just going to drop off of contour out to help hydrate the ridges and then we'll come back into the valley. So it's promoting water moving out to the dry ridges. And this is at a rate of 1 to 400. So it's at a very, very gradual. You could walk just about as fast as the water is flowing. So you're not causing erosion. And this is also how they do um, irrigation canals. So you want an overflow, but you also want water coming in. So you want water coming, say, from a higher elevation flowing into the dam. So in theory, if you did that on this whole level, <coughs> you can capture all the water falling on the top of that hill. You can divert it into that dam all the way around the landscape. And below the dam, you can use that as irrigation canals. What PA Yaumans used to do was create these irrigation canals, these little berm and basin systems, and he would walk along with his shovel, he would open up the dam, and he would walk along with his shovel, plunk the shovel in, and everything behind there would back flood and overflow down. So it would overflow this, and if he stopped right here, put a shovel in, all of this would start overflowing. And he creates sheet flow to that entire landscape. And then he'd keep walking, he'd put his shovel in here, and then he'd irrigate this part. One man irrigating lots of land in a day. He could do acres and acres and acres in a day, and it was all fairly simple for him to do. Other things you can do with dams is put um, pipes right through the dam wall that has a valve that you can turn on from the outside so you can actually provide pressurized irrigation to your entire farm. And the, the main premise of going higher in the landscape is that you can use gravity to your advantage. If your landscape doesn't allow that, you can store the water in a pond at the bottom of your property and then pump it up to another tank that's higher in the landscape and still use gravity with the use of a solar pump. Why not add some fun to the function? This is a, um, a natural swimming pool. So it's a dam, 
but what they've done is they've taken the same amount of surface area that's on the water there and they've doubled it around the outside and they planted plants such as reeds, sedges, bulrushes that naturally filter the water and they've created a self-cleaning ecosystem or swimming pool. Also great for fire protection. Um, swales. So we talked about going off contour and on contour. A swale is an on contour Berman Basin mound. So all it is is taking a scoop of dirt and mounding it downhill. And all that does is when the water flows downhill, it stops it and keeps it level on the landscape, allows it to soak into the ground and creates a water plume. So this could be like making a raised bed on contour. And you could either plant grasses right here, plant trees right here. Um, and in traditional agriculture, it was used as a tree planting system. So wherever you're doing uh, swales on your property, those could also be the markers for your silvopasture. So you can start uh, adding more function to your water harvesting. Now the difference between swales and a diversion drain is that this is an uncompacted mound in a swale and in a um, diversion drain or an irrigation channel, this is compacted. And you want to make this solid because when you cause sheet flow to come out and over this, you want it to stay together and you want this vegetated to, so it doesn't cause any erosion. So if we're looking at linking this system together and we want to create more than one dam, we could say we created a dam here and we want another dam down here. We've got our irrigation channel here and say we did key line up here and down here we did a swale. So any water that's lost or um, excess water that runs off here is now collected in here. The swale will fill up and it'll back flood into the dam. And then you just need another overflow right here. You always plan in overflows. So when your water harvesting at that level is full, it can go down to the next point and it's like uh, Plinko. You're basically starting at the top and working your way down as much as you can get out of it. <coughs> So here's a swale that's been freshly constructed. They put down a cover crop, usually nitrogen fixing to establish a quick ground cover. And they're growing it both on the back and on the front to stop erosion. But you can see that it's holding a lot of water back in the landscape and it's putting it directly into the soil. Mulch basins, this is great for, I just got a new book called The Holistic Orchard and it's, just awesome for going organic, um, traditional organic methods and going beyond um, pest control, everything. It's just a fantastic read, but they're stressing in their mulch basins. So traditionally trees are kind of planted on burial mounds. So we kind of planted trees like that. But if we think about it, we live in a dry land, so we want to reduce the amount of um, evaporation. So by planting them in a mulch basin and just keeping the root mound there, and then filling this up with mulch, provides an area that's going to reduce evaporation, hold the moisture, and really keep, and all the mulch is just going to break down into soil in a couple years, and you're just going to get a really high humic content in there, and a really healthy um, biology of microbes. And also, you're using this, you're always making it, you're always planning for the full width of the tree, so that you can harvest the water dripping down off the tree and it's falling into that mulch basin and it uses the tree as a water collector as well. Boomerangs are kind of a hybrid between swales and uh, mulch basins. So if you're on a slope, you can catch water in one boomerang and they've got a little rock overflow on either edge. And so when this fills up with water, it overflows to either side down to the next set of boomerangs. And so it's like fish scales on the landscape. It's just another strategy for uh, doing an orchard system on a steeper slope. And might as well get the best utility from rainwater as you can. Um, you could also use uh, sheet flow from your key line system to flood irrigate this as well. Constructed wetlands. So we talk about harvesting rainwater a lot, but what about wastewater? Um, Grand, or at Christina Lake, there's a living machine. Is anyone familiar with that? It's a natural waste 
sewage treatment with plant filters. Um, even gray water, we look at gray water. Currently it's illegal to use gray water or reuse gray water in BC. Mm -hmm. I am against this. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's, uh, I think it's crazy. You look um, at Art Ludwig, he's written a book called Creating an Oasis with Gray Water. They have tons of examples and he's uh, worked with many states in the US for getting uh, gray water into building code. And why not? People, Interior Health says it's a health risk. There's never been a documented case of gray water um, illness, especially gray water disease-borne illness, as long as they're properly taken care of. Now, with that being said, we have freeze. So we can't always, we have to have two systems because it'll freeze up in the winter unless we live on the island. So somebody that looks just like me and has a house in the same spot as me, Design their gray water system into their current house <laughs> and um, separated the gray water from the black water and the plumbing. And what happens is 90% um, of the time it just goes into the sewer. But when weather conditions are right, you just flick a three way and it goes out into this constructed wetland. And then it allows reeds, cattails, and sedges to do the cleanup of that gray water. And then, because it's on a high point in the landscape, it can gravity feed the rest of the orchard in the backyard. Right. Theoretically, and so it's there. These are actually used for septic systems, and there's tons of different ways that they can work. Um, here's a simple gray water system. So water from the house comes in. You've got cattails, and then bulrushes, um, uh, reeds, and then going down to your smaller aquatic plants, and then into a storage overflow, and then down to where you need it. Yes. What do you use your system in the winter? you just flick it back to the septic or municipal. Um, there's also a system called Laundry to Landscape that Art Ludwig does. And that's just because your laundry machine comes with a pump anyways, and you're pumping that water out anyways. You can just, if you have a basement window, or you can just put a hole in the wall and pump it out in the summertime, and it can go directly to your trees into mulch basins. Because what is happening is you're allowing the soil microbes to clean up that effluent water and allow it to be processed and microbes do a great job of cleaning soil and cleaning up water. I mean, that's what our sewage systems are doing right now. They take your effluent, hold it in a tank, allow the particles or the solids to separate, and then the effluent goes out and relies on microorganisms to clean them up. And so this is just doing it at a surface level. And gray water is considered anything that's not black water, and black water is your kitchen sink and your toilet. So think about the water savings that happen right there. Showers, unbelievable. And um, yeah, the greatest travesty that's happening in the 21st century is people defecating into perfectly good drinking water. Yeah. So we've got some room for improvement or at least be using that water once it's been used once. Yeah. And there's also large scale water treatment plants. So this is a wet system um, by Jay Abrams out of the UK. And what this is here is this is an apple orchard and a cider. And what they do is they take all the neighbor's waste, all of their waste, and they put it into this large constructed wetland. And by the time it cycles through and gets back to here, the water's clean. And he's done this not just in the UK, but he's done it in a couple different places. Um, he's even done it in dairy operations. So they're taking the liquefied cow manure and they're pumping it into these uh, wetlands. So you can see there the water's not very clean. And then by the time it comes around, everything's sorted out. It's pretty amazing. Um, there's also black water treatment, and this is like uh, this is uh, John Todd, who's designed systems like the Living Machine to use uh, plants to um, clean up waterways. In China, this was their waterway. There was, it was just riddled with sewage and tons of disease. And he finished that planting area, and now people use it as a park. It's just a beautified area. They've brought people back into the environment. The water's cleaned up. There's actually fish moving back up the stream. Um, it's just totally been re rehabilitated. Then, of course, as we're getting smaller in scale, we've got cisterns. So any uh, hard surfaces we have, uh, barns, houses. For instance, take a 1,000-square-foot house. <coughs> 
you can harvest 25,000 gallons off a 1,000 square foot house a year. And that's only in rainwater, not to mention snow. That's a lot of water if you're thinking about it. And now if you think about some of the large barns that are around, you can get a lot of that water. And if you're not storing it in cisterns, you can have that going directly into um, a pond. Home scale harvesting. Um, I'm a big fan of these. They're 1,000 liter totes. You can get them from vineyards. You can get them from organic producers. Most of them are food grade. The ones I get have been used for borage oil, flaxseed oil, that sort of thing. And they're between $75 and $100 for 250 gallons of storage. Usually it's about a buck a gallon for storage. So economical. I, I'd suggest covering them from UV. That is a good suggestion. I, the lot, they're, they're pretty good, but protect your investment. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I clad mine in cedar. I put cedar all around it, and um, or else make sure it's on the north side of your house if you can. That's a great point. So holistic management. I'm just going to touch really quick on creating and growing topsoil because I know I'm running out of time. Um, so Yao Man Cree has this uh, key line plow. He's got the key line strategy for um, taking things slightly off of contour from the key point. And he designed this implement which would send these tines into the soil at, um, at first about six inches into compacted soil. And this also works in sandy soil. And what it does, it's a no-till um, plow that goes in and it just opens up the soil, allows it to breathe, allows it to accept moisture. And you're planting behind it. So you're dropping seeds in there and instantly that allows the seed to get a longer root mass. And then you apply grazing or you apply um, uh, harvesting and you've got more root mass further down. So you're establishing more organic matter in the soil. Next pass, you go a little bit deeper. And so you're going two inches below the last time you went. And you keep just extending the depth of that soil and you grow topsoil. They're seeing topsoil growing um, six to eight inches in three years. Mm. That's pretty huge. Mm. And they're doing this with key line plow and grazing. And has that, anyone heard of Joel Salatin? Of course. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> so Joel Salatin, the lunatic farmer, um, he swears by this. Um, they are. I actually had an audiobook, um, Folks is Saint Normal, and the best part of the whole audiobook is that Joel Salatin narrates it and his, his drawl is pretty good. But he really advocates for having animals on the landscape because it's mimicking the natural cycles of um, the, herding pre the herding prey and predator relationship on the prairies. So it's creating a lot of topsoil quickly. The cows come in and they're cell grazed, so it's mimicking the uh, predator-prey relationship. It keeps the cows tightly clumped together. They aggressively feed, but they also aggressively urinate, and their hooves are cleft, so they till up the soil, and they work their own uh, urine and feces into the soil, um, uh, fertilizing it, and then they're moved on to the next phase that grass is allowed to recover and then it's grazed again. And it's this whole system of cell grazing in these small cells and moving them around the property that creates this uh, huge growth in um, not only the plants but the growth of topsoil as well. And when combined with um, the key lime plow, they're getting phenomenal results. To say nothing of the animal crop. Yeah, exactly. So holistic management isn't just a uh, a series of techniques. What it is, it's a decision-making process for farms and it's a really, if you haven't heard of it, it's really worth looking into. Um, I know there's uh, a holistic management practitioner in Kamloops, but they teach about cell grazing, they teach about crop rotation and um, resting crops, but also dealing with your water and your soil nutrition naturally and um, revegetating landscapes and doing really good work on very little water. There's a series of YouTube videos uh, that Alan Savory, the inventor of holistic management, that just came out a couple months ago. Um, they're down in Washington, so just over the border, and it shows some of the case studies that they're getting really good results. Um, yeah. They're getting growth where they never had growth before. They're getting more moisture, moisture staying longer, and they're getting better growth. 
and it's sequestering carbon. Um, in Australia, they actually get carbon credits. It's carbon farming now. So they get paid to sequester carbon. So doing these no-till methods um, is making farming more profitable there. So key line, we talked about the key point. And this is the difference between key line and swales. When you're on contour, sometimes your uh, lines in between your uh, rows, so if this was a hay crop, or if this was um, something you had to get a, an implement in, and it's say 50 feet wide, and your swales, because landscapes aren't always working out this easy. And so if you've got a contour that's kind of like this, and then one that goes kind of like this, if you did swales on this, your swale will go like this and then like that. And your machine is this wide, you're coming through and then you're chopping into your other swale. So it really doesn't make it convenient for getting machinery onto the site. Um, what's nice about key line is you go even spaced all the time. So when you go above the key point, you're still taking the water from the valley out to the ridge. It's still falling and even when you go below the key point you're taking the, it from the valley out to the ridge. It works both ways and that's what's genius about the system. The water is always moving from the wet to the dry areas. For Yaomans to have just done this on uh, observation alone was an unbelievable feat. But it's really a neat system. So here's what a key line plow area looks like. So you can see the farm or the, the machine going slightly off contour each time and going out towards the, uh, ah, it's in Spanish. Another um, good website is one called Mas Humus and it's about the key line, what's going on down um, Central America with uh, key line. But they're always taking the water out to the ridge. What is it called? Mas Humus, M-A-S Humus, H-U-M-U-S. And they're doing all sorts of stuff with um, bio waste as well. But it's very non-invasive. So the implement itself has these shanks on it, removable shanks. And they just, there's some disc cutters here. They just open up the soil. The key line plow goes in. And then there's a rolling disc behind it that closes the ground back up. And what that does from a side profile, It kind of looks like this. And these are the time marks. So when water comes flowing down, it stores up a little bit and then comes up and in. And then it stores up in here and then goes up and in. And so it's micro water harvesting because this is all almost uh, against contour. And what they've done is taken it one step further. Further, Darren Doherty, who is really pioneering uh, key line design, is adding compost tea and seed planting. So in one pass, he is providing active microbes into the soil. He's seeding and the compost tea is increasing germination rates and also working to loosen up compact soil and he's saving in diesel because he only has to make one pass. Mm -hmm. And so it's economical, it's low impact and it's just a really smart way of farming. And you don't necessarily need the key line plow. There are other um, no-till plows out there. Um, I know we looked at getting a key line plow up in Vernon. It's $10,000 for the basic plow, and they have to come out of Maine, so then you're looking at shipping. And then if you want the cedars, then it's more, and then it's like a bad infomercial. <laughs> Just keeps adding up. <laughs> um, what about a cultivator? Um, cultivator is more working up the soil. Yeah, and it's uh, what's great about this is it's not tilling up the soil, it's keeping it static. Um, the next best thing to this that I've had experience with is a spader. And for cover cropping, and use that with garlic, it's really great at taking the root clumps and just flipping it upside down so you get more of that biomass bio in the soil. There's a, a lot of different no-till implements, uh, including uh, liquid manure injectors that I've seen out in Alberta, because um, they've all switched over to, well, uh, 
I round up uh, no-till agriculture um, in a lot of cases there, but they have come up with a lot of implements that might that do something similar. I don't know if they have quite the same um, surface profile after, but they've got various different chisels that that can just as well. Yeah, and I mean it's smart design. Yeah. One nice thing that um, the key line has is the spring loaded. So if you do hit a rock or something, it just it does bump back. It's not going to rip off the the tines. But you can see the key line um, after they've sowed the seeds. And there's tons of different um, methods that are being developed in Australia. I'm not really sure if they'll translate over to North America, but uh, pasture cropping. So it's allowing the cattle to go in and graze. Then you go in, you uh, key line up the soil and plant it out. And then um, as the undergrowth starts to germinate and seed, you bring the cattle through on another um, rotation of grazing. And then you allow the crop from underneath to grow up, and then you harvest it. And then you let it rest for a couple of years. And so it's that um, successional planting happening again. And then there's also no-kill agriculture, no-till. Um, lots of good stuff, but just not enough research has been done in North America, especially up this far north. Yes? Um, is that not the same prin principle as terraces? It's very, yeah. Um, that's more Sepp Holzer, and he's another water genius. Um, I know that. But I mean, in Asia, in, in Nepal, it's very steep valleys, and everything is terrace. Mm -hmm. Since, since a long time, it's never they cultivate And yeah, what they're doing is holding back all of that torrential rain. And yeah, that works well. Yeah, there. it goes in this steps. Mm -hmm. Same. Yep, absolutely. That's just, um, I think those systems are really a lot more to implement, but I, and I haven't seen anybody really do the terrace type systems here. There's one garlic farm out in um, uh, Trinity Valley that wants to start doing sort of a terrace system because yeah, whenever you create that level landscape, the water's just going to sit there and accumulate. So in theory it should work. And that's the thing. Um, I see a lot of these uh, different systems all over being applied in different places around the world, but it's really about um, picking what's going to be right for our climate. So for instance here with your sandy soils, um, it seems to me like uh, increasing the organic content is going to be number one. You want to, that moisture to stay in there longer. So it's all about knowing your climate and then uh, picking the appropriate strategy and techniques for that climate. Um, here's an example of New Mexico. So they had a capped landscape and they just took the key line plow and went up and down this landscape. Now the only difference is this is flat. So when the key line plow is going on flat landscape, it goes perpendicular to contour. So it just rips across and creates some um, channels. And this is no water just over a year later. That's the same piece of land just opened it up, got rid of the cap surface, allow the seeds that were already in there to germinate, and nature is off and running. <laughs> now, results not typical. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Darren Doherty. He, he talked about um, how he went by this uh, piece of land all the time, and he always saw these cows on it, just a few cows ranging around. But you can see this little green mm -hmm. spot right there. Yeah. That is the key point. And he said one day he's just going to show up there with a bulldozer and he's just going to go in, he's going to mark the key point, he's going to mark out his key line, so contour around, he's going to build a dam, he'll have his irrigation channels running in, irrigation flow coming out to sheet flow for the cows to keep the pastures going. And he said, why not put a saddle dam on? Might as well put water higher up in the landscape. You can pump from here up to there so you have more pressure. And then Again, you've got your channels running in, and then your irrigation canals, uh, canals coming out. Make those areas of your dam infiltration into roads, and then everywhere over 30 degrees, you're cropping or else uh, putting trees on, and then everything else is used for cattle ranging. And it's just like that. Watching this guy design a landscape is just, he acts like there's nothing to it. But he's really learned to apply the key line principles into simple steps and it makes functional farms. So you're always putting roadways where they go up easiest. Whenever you're putting a road in, you're always going up the, um, up the ridge because it's usually the least slope. And 
it just makes sense for practical application. So final thoughts. Um, what we're trying to do with permaculture and water harvesting is turn problems into solutions. So if we have erosion, it means that we've just got a little bit of water that's out of control and we want to use that to more productive use. Um, it's about thinking about strategies versus techniques. A lot of times I'm guilty of this. I just want to do the technique. I want to get, um, get my hands dirty and just uh, get things done. But really taking the time to design something out, one hour of design saves you 100 hours worth of work. Um, collaborating as a community and making those community ties. So as the Ag Society grows, um, has there ever been any talk about a community tool shed or um, community co-op for purchasing implements? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. And then um, creating a culture of regenerative agriculture. So really just sharing ideas and techniques and what's working and what isn't working and just creating those dialogues. Um, it's just going to spread this idea of regenerative agriculture throughout. So, um, I do have a couple more slides just of what final systems do look like. So this is a um, key line system. You'll notice the nice even spacing, and this is all agroforestry. This is exactly two widths of the um, tractor, so they can get two tractor widths on the whole property and still room to turn around at the end. This is a contour property, so you see some of the contours are further apart and some are closer together. So it might make it uh, less productive if you have machinery, but if you're doing things um, like if you're just doing agroforestry, it can still be productive. This is uh, David Holmgren's site, so original permaculture site, and this is all done on key line. Everything's been laid out appropriately. You've got a dam higher up in the landscape, another main dam. You can see the roadway coming in over the dam wall and then um, irrigating all the food forest below. And then another site laid out on contour. So just different examples of how people are creating these integrated har water harvesting systems. And water harvesting is only the first step. After that, the real work starts. Because um, in permaculture, we're always designing for water access and structures. And Keyline just takes that a step further and takes a little bit more of the landscape into effect. And so if you do this and you implement it cor correctly, it can save you a ton of work and uh, create more sustainable landscapes, regenerative landscapes. And finally, one last, just with a couple more examples of what can be done on a landscape. Are there any questions? Is, is there a um, guideline around the scale? Is there anything, that, uh, is there a piece of land that either is, well, would not be too big, but what is, what is the minimal sized um, scale that this, these kinds of principles can be applied to? Every scale. That's what's so great about it. You just choose the appropriate strategy for the scale. So um, we teach this a lot of the times just for urban. I left most of the urban stuff out of this, but we teach it at a home scale. And so then you're looking at rain barrels, smaller swales, and uh, you're just making them sized appropriate to the landscape. And then when you go on to a larger scale, you just um, up the size, up the scale, and uh, just changed how you're going to distribute the water. But I mean, Darren Doherty's uh, planted out million acre forestry projects with Key Line. That's, that's a big area. That's where in Australia? That's in Australia. You should import him. <laughs> <laughs> he actually hasn't come to North America since for over a year now. He says he's sticking close to home now. But there are people doing Key Line now down in Oregon. Um, there are, it's slowly getting adopted. Um, Oregon seems to be like a hotbed for permaculture and regenerative agriculture. And uh, just need the interest up here to start propagating these ideas and spreading them and people willing to try things. But you do need the clay. I mean, you know, if you've got a porous soil, it's what do you want to do on a slope? If anybody's interested, shameless plug, um, look at Element Eco Design on Facebook. Uh, we posted some. The company name is Element Eco Design, and feel free, I do have brochures up here that just have the contact info, but um, we posted 
videos on holistic management and uh, Keyline a couple weeks ago, and I'll repost those videos. So it's um, Washington State is where all the holistic management practices have been taking place, and uh, the Keyline stuff has been happening in um, high ele elevations in California, very porous soils, and it tells about all their strategies that they're using to um, deal with that condition. What was that called? Um, element Eco Design or Facebook okay. Facebook dot com slash Element Eco Design. He's got his cards. Up. And so I'll repost all that stuff because um, nobody's really teaching Keyline in Canada. It'd be great if we could get some instructors in uh, that have a lot more practical knowledge, and we need somebody to get a, a Keyline implement up here. That's why I said community. <laughs> 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 Well, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you guys very much for having me out, and thank you for the wonderful meal. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was, that was great, and I hope everyone got some, some piece that they're going to take home with them.